Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report, chatting with John Rubino. We're going to be talking geopolitics, the war escalation of war in the Middle East, as well as what we're seeing on the markets in terms of higher dollar, higher interest rates, also higher inflation in terms of economic data, what that means for underlying markets and metals, as we always do cycle around to the precious metals. You can follow John on his Substack page, which we will link to below. Now, John, look, uh, we have an escalation of war in the Middle East as Iran attacks Israel over the weekend. Now, this was, in a way, I guess, kind of expected throughout last week. And at the tail end of last week on Friday, we saw some wild market volatility. Today, the market started off fairly muted, I guess. However, as we're talking this, they are really starting to move lower. Overall, though, John, it doesn't seem like this escalation of war having maybe the same effect that uh, past wars have or past geopolitical issues. What's going on here, John? What are your thoughts? Hey, Corey. Hey, Chad. Well, you know, we seem to be immune to geopolitics in the financial markets here because we've been on the verge of a shooting war between Russia and NATO for a long time. Nobody seems to care. The stock market is still up. You know, the financial markets are functioning just as they, they normally do. And now you've got, like you said, Iran actually attacked Israel. <laughs> This weekend, that's I, I don't think that's ever happened, at least on this kind of a scale. Their, their soldiers might have shot at each other in previous Mideast wars, but there's never been 200 cruise missiles and drones from Iran to Israel before this. This is a new thing. But this morning, the markets just didn't seem to care, you know. But then, like you said, also today, the markets are getting kind of uh, volatile, but it looks like it's more of a domestic thing in the U.S. because inflation is kind of picking up and uh, retail sales. I think it was retail sales today that came out stronger than usual. The 10-year Treasury yield is up. So it looks like we're we're kind of moving back into that um, higher for longer until something breaks place that we were in for the past year. And that's roiling the markets a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's just funny that uh, that uh, we we you know all the stuff is going on in the world, and the the U.S. Um, and Canadian financial markets just do not seem to care. They care about what's happening right here, right now, within our borders. So, but that's enough to worry about. I mean, the 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 10-year Treasury yield going back up to 4.6 percent in the U.S. means mortgage rates get back over 7 percent probably. And we still got that commercial real estate bust waiting to happen. We still got the uh, uh, the local and regional banks that are going to be hurt by the commercial real estate thing. Yada yada. You know the things we've been talking about for quite a while are still there, and it looked like they might be fading for a while with interest rates going down. But uh, maybe not. You know, if interest rates are going to go back up, then all of those other worries are are um, back on the front burner. So we'll see. And and. Israel is apparently um, not done with this whole thing. They uh, they're working out a strategy for what to hit next in Iran. So this the geopolitics thing isn't over yet. It just seems like the markets don't really care. Yeah, John, it's really strange. Like if you think about the end of last week, all anybody cared about was the geopolitical part of it. And that's why you saw gold and silver just spike up crazy. You saw oil going up. And then even by the end of the day on Friday, it was a huge reversal. A lot of people had hedges on and people that track the hedge books were saying that most of those have rolled off this morning. And then now everything has shifted back to, OK, well, what about interest rates? What about the Fed cuts? And there's a lot of messaging in the financial media over the weekend and even today, John, saying maybe there'll be no cuts this year. That that message is growing stronger. It, it's crazy to have come into the year with expectations for seven rate cuts. And now we're down to possibly one or zero. Do you think that that's really what's weighing on things now? Like you say, the shift back to the domestic? Well, you know, I've given up trying to say what is important out there, but it sure seems like interest rates going back up and the perception that we're not going to get any easing out of the Fed this year ought to be a very big deal for the financial markets because a lot of the, the bull market that we've seen lately in tech and elsewhere was premised on the idea that uh, we're going to have a soft landing, we're going to go back to easing money. 
interest rates are going to go back down. You'll be able to get financing for whatever you want, yada, yada. And, uh, and if that's not true, then we've got some extreme valuations out there in the financial markets that need to be repriced, right? You would think. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, I think the, the big takeaway from all of this is that in the long run, fundamentals matter. And in the short run, the market's just going to do whatever it feels like. And, you know, don't don't stress yourself out trying to predict from one week to the next where we're going to be, because uh, that's something that maybe somebody has a trading strategy for. But uh, I certainly don't. So, John, what's driving the metals and even the oil price? Because both have been moving higher, gold, silver, even gold today is slightly up. I know some people would expect it to be up higher on these geopolitical impacts, but you do have to factor that the dollar's higher. Interest rates are higher. Oil, I think a lot of people thought that would be higher because of this war in the Middle East. But generally, $85 for oil and almost 2400 for gold, still high prices. So what is driving these moves then? Well, a few things with gold. One is that it should be way higher than it is. You know, the the intrinsic value of gold is five to ten thousand dollars U.S. per ounce, so it should be moving in that direction just to get to where it's fairly valued. Um, what's happening in the moment, though, I think has a lot to do with the uh, the world's central banks becoming really aggressive gold buyers. And that, that hasn't ended. China's, for instance, uh, gold buying is down a little bit year over year, but it's still positive. You know, China is still, even at these higher prices, still buying gold. And uh, presumably some of the other central banks are too. So that's a big tailwind for a, a sector that's really not that big. You know, there isn't that much available gold out there. There's a fair bit of gold above ground, but most of it is in very strong hands. Um, you know, you're not going to see the central banks turn around and start selling again if gold goes up another 100 bucks an ounce or whatever. A lot of the rest of gold is in um, jewelry. You know, it's in family jewel, jewel boxes or um, safes and things. Um, and it has sentimental value that goes far beyond the value of the metal within the necklaces and bracelets and things. And that's not going to be just turned around and sold if gold goes up so a bit from here. So there isn't really that much available supply and you've got these big buyers out there now. And the, there's a sense that the world's central banks are going to start easing in a coordinated way. Now, we, we talked about that maybe not being the case, but up until just lately, that was the expectation. Everybody thought that it wouldn't be just be one central bank. It would be most central banks going back to easing again. And that may not be true. So I, I think that spiking interest rates and um, less of an expectation of ease on the part of central banks going forward is a big risk for precious metals because that, again, in theory, you know, what should happen uh, doesn't always happen, but um, that ought to um, lessen the appetite out there for inflation hedges. But it could be that the, the central banks don't care about stuff like that. They're looking at, uh, at the global financial system in kind of a geopolitical framework where um, they want an alternative to the dollar for their reserve assets. And clearly gold is their choice and they're nowhere near done buying. If the goal is to be somewhat independent of dollars as reserve assets, they've got a lot more buying to do. And so it could just be that um, it doesn't matter what interest rates do in the short run. It doesn't matter whether the economy is growing or not. Central banks are going to be a big enough buyer to support gold going forward. That's that's a scenario. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether it works out that way, but uh, uh, I think that um, the, the general thesis for gold is still positive. Now, silver lately has been um, outperforming gold in percentage terms. And uh, last time I looked this morning, gold was up like 0.6% or something like that, and silver was up 2%. And that is one of those things that's to be expected in a precious metals bull market at some point when uh, when the early money starts coming into precious metals, it goes into gold, gold outperforms silver. And then at some point, silver looks so cheap compared to gold that people start um, piling into that and it starts to outperform gold. Uh, for instance, uh, in one interesting stat from, I guess it was last week, but the, um, the Indian gold imports 
um, in February were something like 260% up year over year. So uh, it could be that for a lot of the, um, the wedding gifts that get given in Asia um, and that are usually gold, uh, it could be that silver is replacing gold in some of those cases. There was an article the other day, and I think this is Egypt they were talking about. It could have been Turkey, but I'm pretty sure it was Egypt. And the headline was, silver is the new gold. And it's because of that. Gold has gotten too expensive for a lot of people to give the normal kind of wedding gifts that they would give. So they're switching to silver where they can get a lot more metal. You know, the, the box is bigger. <laughs> and... Uh, that's kind of how it usually goes. You know, people find reasons to buy silver when gold goes way up and then silver outperforms. So, you know, if that's where we are in the cycle, that would be awesome. Speaking as a stacker, I would I would love silver to go back up to 50 and then uh, and maybe just gap up to 100. What do you think? Yeah, John, I think that there's a lot of rationale behind that, that you're seeing a lot of people shift from buying gold, not just in India, but also in China and all throughout Asia, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, Korea. You're seeing a shift to buying more silver in the West in addition to the gold. And we've been pointing out on the show that central banks may buy gold, but they don't buy silver or mining stocks. And over the last two months, you've seen a big uptick in silver, like you say, silver outpacing gold, and you've seen uh, even the mining stocks get on the go. However, with regards to the mining stocks, John, you would still think if we had back up the clock in a time machine a couple of years and told people we'll be near $2,400 gold, silver will be up above 28, blasting up to 30, and then coming back right now, it's around 2880. You would think the mining stocks would have responded in a bigger way. Do you think we'll see a gradual appreciation of these mining stocks as they re-rate higher, as people digest these prices and see them being stickier? Or do you think we're just permanently disconnected now? No, I, I, well, I think there's a reason. Um, well, there are two reasons. One is that people just got disgusted with mining stocks and walked away and they, they aren't even paying attention to what's happening with them lately. Um, the other reason is that costs are up for mining. So you don't get the same um, relationship between the price of gold and operating margins, for instance, for a mine, if the mine's costs are going up. And that's a real thing out there, you know, especially with oil back up into the 80s now, um, it costs more to mine gold. Therefore, the price of gold has to go up even more than it would have in a you know flat pricing environment or a flat cost environment. You know, we'll, we'll find out operationally where it where gold has to go to start generating big increases in cash flow with the miners pretty soon. The next few earnings reports will be with gold at a higher price. And if we start seeing positive reports where all of a sudden cash flow doubled uh, year over year, things like that start coming out, uh, then that would definitely light a fire under the miners. And uh, in the meantime, they still had a pretty good month. You know, it's, at least they're moving in the right direction. They just aren't rocking yet the way you would expect them to in a record high gold price environment. So it, it might be that we need a couple more earnings seasons with positive earnings to um, to make that happen. But it's up to the miners, you know, if they can control their costs, uh, then gold is is doing its part. You know, they'll, they'll have wider margins if they're uh, selling gold for 23.50 um, and their costs are stable. You know, that, that would be a really nice financial statement uh, for a miner to be able to do that. And we'll see, we'll see how close they get. Cause it could be that uh, the past couple of years, Obviously, they've been focused on controlling costs, and we'll see how much of that pays off. Yeah, it's so interesting to see GDX right back to kind of where it was when gold was at 2000, so 20% lower than where it was, but uh, GDX kind of just right back to that level. That underperformance continues, but we did see some life, and even last time we chatted, you mentioned some of the smaller stocks gaining momentum more at the very tail end of March and the very beginning of April. What are you seeing on the junior front here, John, where a lot of us are invested, a lot of these companies still need to raise cash. We've seen a lot of financings be released. These stocks, many of them have at least maybe gone up 50% or even doubled from recent lows, but they're still a long way off of any sort of sustainable runs higher. So what are you viewing in the junior equities when it comes to gold stocks? Yeah, um, my junior mining stock portfolio 
had a pretty good month, but I, I never even thought of taking any profits. Actually, because there are still are very few profits to take, actually, even though they, they went up from their lows, but they're still crazy cheap, both um, in terms of history and in terms of what they should be worth to um, an acquirer or something like that. So I, I think there's a long, long way to go for the juniors and the explorers and the developers if um, if gold and silver continue their current trends. So that, that will still be a, a, a dramatic bull market at some point, but the metals have to metals have to perform, you know, they have to, silver has to continue to go up, gold has to at least hold where it is now. Um, and then we'll eventually get a lot of action in the uh, the junior mining space. But yeah, they, they were just so beaten down. A reasonably good month uh, was nice to have, but it, it didn't bring them anywhere near a, a reasonable sell point for a lot of these things. So I, I think there's a long way to go. And again, go for quality in that space because there is a lot of quality. There, there are a lot of explorers out there that are just generating um, killer drill results. And they're, they're getting closer and closer. If they don't already have a resource, they're getting closer and closer to be able to, to the point where they can release a, a maiden resource report and show everybody what they've got. But, uh, you know, there, there was an interesting um, interview that Bob Moriarty did the other day where he was talking about newfound gold to give one example here. And he said, well, they're between 5,000 ounces or 5 million ounces and 50 million ounces. <laughs> and nobody knows where they are on that spectrum, but um, they, they've definitely got 5 million ounces nailed down. So that's a kind of an extreme example, but uh, there, there are other ones out there who once they you know finally report an actual resource is going to be an impressive number. So you, you want to go for them early on because they're the ones who have actually done most of the work, you know, in, in the mind of uh, uh, the minds of people who understand the business and who are looking at these companies, they, they already kind of have a, a, a resource in mind. People kind of sort of know what someplace like uh, Snowline Gold has, but they haven't just, it hasn't been announced yet. It's not official, but be in that, group, you know, where, where most of the work is already done and there's just the uh, the final report that has to come out to uh, to let everybody know that this is a major resource. Um, and I think that group, not every one of them, of course, is is going to pan out. But uh, in that group, say, let's say there, there are 10 of them out there right now, seven or eight of them will just work out. There'll be success stories at some point. And that's where you want to be right now, because there, there are a lot of other ones that will emphatically not be uh, success stories, even though they sound pretty good right now. So go for the ones who have already um, proven that they've got something serious there. Yeah, some good advice, John, on going with the companies that have already done a lot of quality work and have some proof in the pudding or proof in the pudding is imminent. And uh, you're basically buying in all that future value creation before it gets uh, a better value from the market. Now, we've talked a lot about precious metals resource stocks uh, because the precious metals tie into interest rates and the dollar and what's happening with the Fed and geopolitics. But I know in your Substack articles, you also cover a lot of other commodities. We've seen a big move in copper and the copper stocks. Oil stocks have actually done pretty well on the back of the rising oil. Uranium stocks have been a roller coaster. Are there any other sectors that really have your attention right now? Well, you know, some of the base metals might be interesting because did, did you see, uh, I think it was just over the weekend where the U.S. and Great Britain announced that they were banning the importation of Russian metals, <laughs> you know, so, and, or, you know, Russia is a pretty good producer of a lot of basic commodities. And if we're going that route, then it could be that we're going to create shortages here. And uh, that's a that's a potential trade if we're going to cut off the supply of some big chunk of tin or zinc or aluminum or something like that. So it's possible that there's uh, there's an interesting story there. And I, I don't know enough about uh, the supply demand dynamics in any of those um, metals, but it looks like we're we're creating a more favorable environment for the miners who are in um, good ju jurisdictions. In other words, the non-Russian miners, that's a possible thing. But I think I think the energy thing is, uh, is just a really interesting story right now because of AI. The numbers that people are tossing around for the amount of electricity that's gonna be needed for just all the NVIDIA chips that are being sold right now 
is immense. And uh, I think that is a tailwind for the energy space in general and for you know copper, which you can include in the energy space. So there's a lot of good stories out there right now. Some of them are, are technological and some of them are ge geopolitical. But I, I think there's, there's no end of interesting things to check out in the commodity space right now. All right, John, thank you. In terms of what stocks you're looking at, especially the Explorers, sounds like some of the ones that you're looking at, still some of the higher flying ones too, and Snowline Gold, Newfound Gold, those ones have, have garnered the attention of the market. It's been nice to see some standout stocks in a much wider market there where a lot of stocks have been almost left behind by the rest of the market. We'll follow up with you in a couple of weeks there, John. I hope you have a great rest of your week. And as always, thank you for your time. Thanks, guys.